Father, I pray that um, as we're opening up this topic tonight, Holy Spirit, just move across this room, move in our hearts, move in our minds, tear down walls, um, take the veils down. These are areas and things that maybe we, we don't want to talk about. Maybe we haven't touched for very many years. Maybe they're still very tender. Um, maybe we feel like we don't have any issues in this area and we're, we're good to go. I, I pray that you would just speak to us tonight, um, reveal things to us, uh, I, I just use your light of illumination in these dark areas within us, Lord, to bring them to light, to help us to become aware of them so that we can um, give them to you and grow and move forward in our, in our walk and become mature so that we can be that light to others around us. And so, Father, we just give you this time, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, emotions, they play a key role in our walk with God. And I want to stress this to you guys tonight, because it's easy to want to brush this off or, you know, to think this isn't really a serious topic. But I guarantee you, like Pastor Ed said, if we are emotionally unhealthy, we will not grow spiritually. We will not. We will be stuck. And this is the number one reason why we have so many Christians running around and they're being a bad influence. They're being a bad representation because they have not grown. Maybe, maybe they really know their Bible. They could quote scripture to you, man. They've memorized it. They know all the answers, but they snap at people. They're, they don't have patience. They're not showing that love, right? Why is that? And, and that is always going to be a heart issue. That's always going to be something that's going to cause them to stumble and to cause them to remain stuck. And I don't want that for any of us. And I know this because this was me. This was me. And it took God speaking into me in a moment. Of, of realization, right? It, it hurt. It hurt. God told me one day, he said, you are a nominal Christian. And I had to look that word up. I was like, what is nominal? Pastor Ed does this to me all the time. I'm like, what does that word mean? And I look it up and it said, in name only, not genuine. Yeah, ouch, right? I was a Christian in name only, but I wasn't a genuine one. And so that changed my life, okay? That made me start repenting, God, I don't want to be a nominal Christian. I want to be a real genuine Christian. So whatever you have to do in me to begin this process, then I'm willing to do it. And it's easy to say that. It's hard to walk that out, let me tell you. But that will begin a process in your life. And God will show up in a mighty way. And the Holy Spirit will empower you to do this. So don't think that you're doing this on your own. I know that it can be daunting and intimidating, especially when we've had traumatic backgrounds. Or there's stuff that we just don't want to, we don't want to open it up again. I remember my aunt telling me one time when I was young, uh, my, my mom and her were having a conversation and my mom was talking about going to therapy and, and some of the things that the therapist had told her. And one of the things was, was that we tend to take things from our past and we put them in boxes and we push them under the bed and we don't want to take them out. We think that they'll be fine. And my, my aunt got really nervous and she said, don't ever take out the boxes. Don't touch those boxes. They stay where they are. But, you know, that's just something, again, that will ca cause us to be stuck. And so one thing I want to talk about really quickly so that we kind of have an understanding, because I've found that a lot of Christians don't really understand how we're made up. But I want you guys to get this picture that we are made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body. Okay? A spirit, a soul, and a body. And so I want to break this down a little bit for you. But our spirit is eternal. All right? It will either exist eternally with Christ, if we, Romans 10, 9, we're saved, right? Or it will exist eternally separated from Christ in hell, right? We believe that hell is a literal place. So that's what our spirit man is. We also have a body. We all know that. Some of us are happy with it. Some of us are not. Some of us are trying to get it into shape, right? But we know that no matter what we do, our bodies will perish, but we also know that as Christians, that we will receive a glorified body. Philippians 3.21 tells us that Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So praise God, we will receive a glorified body. 
Now, our soul is a little bit more complex, okay? And this is where there can be like some confusion or, or maybe we're just not quite sure what our soul is. But I want to make it simple as I can for you. So our soul is three parts. Everybody say three parts. Three parts. Three parts. Mind, mind, will, will and emotions. Okay? So our mind obviously is our thought life. Okay? Our will is what we want to do. And our emotions are how we feel. Now, we can't separate that. We were created that way. So that's not something that we can try to change, no matter how hard we try. That is our makeup. That is who we are. Now, God intends that, as believers, that we are healthy in each of these areas. And we know that Scripture tells us that a healthy mind is going to have God thoughts, right? Romans 12, 2 tells us, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by how? Changing the way you think. Then, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So, Scripture teaches that when our mind is in line with God's thinking, then our will, or what we want, is going to be in line and surrendered to what God wants, okay? So, Seems simple enough. Think God thoughts. I'm going to want to do God things. But where does that leave our emotions? How do we reconcile when our feelings don't line up with what we want to do? Right? Paul talks about that. So I kind of want to throw this out there, and I'm going to get you guys to talk a little bit. But I want to hear what are some of the things that you guys do to deal with your emotions? Because we all know we have them, whether negative or positive. But what do we do when our emotions are wanting to overrun our thoughts or how, what we want to do or what God wants us to do? Be brave. There's no wrong answers. Michelle. Um, I just embrace them. Okay. Acknowledge them, embrace them, and replace the lies of what the devil is telling me with what God wants me to believe and think. Mm-hmm. And kind of look at them. With a filter, you know, a religious filter, a godly filter. Okay. And see if there's any fruit to my channel. Excellent. It's good. It's good. Lourdes. Um, when I tend to, like, when the things fall behind, I'm like, stop. And it seems like it's a wicked thing to be doing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's good. Gerard. I have a go to phrase when I feel the emotions start to run away. Uh huh. And I usually bring it over and it tends to ground me. Okay. Apparently, it's that moment when I have therapy. You know, I did have some parent issues and mm-hmm. and now I get to get out of the Catholic Church and I have a different view of the world, but God is Jesus. So, um, it tends to ground me when my emotions start to uh, run away. I just have to stop and get myself back to the place. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Pastor Ed. I think it'd be great for me to say, like, every single time I'm down my emotions, that the first thing I do is go to Jesus. I try, but I can list a lot of things. Yeah. I need a pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, yeah. well, I do, like, we, you know, we isolate, mm-hmm. we uh, talk too much maybe to other people, we go to other people for uh, help me with this, and, and I think, not always, but I mean, if we're being honest, yeah. you know, I think that yeah. those are some of the struggles. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's good. So let me ask you guys this. How many of you people could raise your hand right now and say, oh, I know exactly, biblically, what to do with my emotions when they strike? 
See, this isn't something that we're taught. Like, I know I wasn't taught this. I, I, I didn't have, my parents did get, they found Jesus, they got saved, they got us in church, and I thank God for that. But they kind of grew in, in their, you know, religious walk as we did. And they didn't know, like, how to teach us these things. They didn't even really know about emotions themselves. They both came from very traumatic, abusive childhoods, and they were struggling just to get through those issues, let alone how to raise and, and bring up emotionally mature kids. And so most of us, I know, have had similar stories, and we're kind of left to our own, right? We become adults, and we have to just kind of figure it out. And a lot of us don't even understand or have ever heard about emotional health and what that looks like and how we can grow in that area and how we can heal ourselves and, and do it with the Holy Spirit. And this is something that has become bigger and bigger over the last few years. Why? Because mental health in the secular world alone has become huge. And it's something that I am so proud that I'm in the church and I'm in ministry at the time I am now because we, for the first time in many years as a, as a body of believers, we're recognizing and we're saying, this stuff is real. This stuff is real. We all deal with different struggles and we need to do this in a biblical way, right? We need to always go to God, but we need to help each other. And the first thing we need to do is become aware. We need to become aware of our emotions. And most of us aren't. Why? Because we're taught not to show those things, okay? So the, the key point on your paper um, is the definition of emo emotional health. Emotional health is about how we feel about ourselves. How many of you, maybe yourself or you know someone that has low self-esteem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lack of confidence. Kind of always down on themselves. Don't think they can do it. What about the opposite? How many of us know someone who's really arrogant? <laughs> right? Right? Um, so it's about knowing how we feel about ourselves, how we acknowledge both our own. Okay, this is where we need to have awareness. Our own and other people's feelings. Right? It's not just about us. We've all heard that one. It's not just about you. Right? And how we handle difficult situations. So you see how this is like a domino effect. Like if I'm not emotionally healthy, I'm probably not going to interact with people in a healthy way, okay? But if I'm healthy and if I'm working on that path of emotional health and I'm becoming aware of my feelings as they're happening, it's going to help me have better, you know, conflict, right? Because we're all going to have conflict at some time or another. But if we're healthy, we're going to have healthy conflict. And there's a huge difference because healthy conflict is always going to bring people together. It's always going to have a spirit of, spirit of love and unity behind it, not how I'm going to one-up the other person, right? So if you come into conflict with people, you find yourself having conflict with people all the time, or you're just one of those people that's like, um, everybody around me is an idiot. <laughs> like Pastor Ed says, you might be the problem, right? Right? So we need to be able to take a look at ourselves and to have that self-awareness. Okay, so... Emotional health is what helps us not just survive, but also heal. Every single one of us in this room needs to heal. Every single one of us in this room has had different past relationships that were negative. We've had maybe adults, teachers speak negative words into us and over us. Things have affected us in an unhealthy, negative way. And the norm is to just say, well, I, I, I'm just going to have to get past that. Just keep, keep going forward, right? Put on a tough, a tough face and just go. And that will never work. Okay, so emotional wellness or health is an essential component if we want our everyday life to feel whole and balanced and to be enabled to grow and mature as believers. So again, this is something that we must be willing to become aware of and address or we will not grow spiritually. Proverbs 17.22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And I know every single one of us has met that person that has that crushed spirit. You ever walk away from someone and just be like, man, like they have a black cloud on them, right? Like an Eeyore, everything is bad. <laughs> right? How are you doing? Well, I'm just not doing well. And they probably are, are having a crushed spirit. And so I love the breakdown of this verse, but 
This one uh, commenter, he said, there is a mysterious power that mood has over physical health. Again, if we think we can just brush this stuff off, your body is going to start telling you, you can't. Even if you feel like you can push this stuff out of your mind and move forward, and it's, it's not affecting me, it's going to show up in your physical body. When one has a crushed spirit, it, can't, it cannot help but hurting the body. Life is holistic, and the body and soul are interleaked. The Christian is created soul and body by God. Okay, remember, we talked about this. We cannot separate it, okay? We cannot separate it. The original Hebrew here for the word merry means joyful, happy, and full of cheer. And the heart in this scripture, yes, you guessed it, it's your inner self, your thoughts, your emotions, and your will. So when this verse says heart, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about our thoughts, our emotions, and our will. So if we want to have a joyful heart, we don't want to have a crushed spirit, then we need to be healthy in all three of these areas. And it also says it's good medicine, right? It's almost like it's saying that it's a cure. It's a cure. That health in these three areas, it makes for overall good health. This is what God intends for every single one of us. This is how we can be light. This is how we can be salt. This is how we are going to be a good witness to those who are around us. This is how we can genuinely comfort people, how we can genuinely enter in to people's things, right? It's like when I was emotionally immature, I didn't want to deal with anybody else's emotions because I couldn't deal with my own. So if someone was grieving or in a dark place, I, I wanted to avoid that at all costs because I had no idea what to do and I did not want to deal with those emotions because I wasn't dealing with my own. But when we start to embrace and accept these things and visit them and go through them with the Holy Spirit and we get healed out of that, well, guess what? I can sit down with someone when they're going through a tough time and I can just be present. I'm not afraid it, and everything inside of me isn't like, get out of here, we can't deal with this. These are feelings, feelings are bad, right? I'm able to sit there and just be with them in that. And I can be compassionate and I can be like, man, I, I know this is hard that you're going through this. This must be really difficult for you. And I can validate and not try to, be, I don't know about you, but my parents, it was always like, if I was struggling with something, they, they were still trying to heal emotionally themselves. And so they would think like, well, I need to fix it. And as parents, we want to do that anyway, right? We want to fix our kids or we want to fix our spouse or our significant others. But we always want to start offering up solutions. But that's not always a healthy response because sometimes people just need you to listen to them. And if we're healthy, we're going to be able to do that. If we're unhealthy, we're probably just going to want to fix it and get out of there. So this is why, this is just more of the reasons why this is so important. Okay, so many of us are walking around with crushed spirits and we're not even aware of it. We're not even aware of it. Others of us are aware of it, but we've chosen to either ignore it or bury it deep inside thinking it's not going to affect us. The problem is, is that it will come out whether we like it or not, no matter how deep you try to bury it no matter how far you kick those boxes under the bed. It's going to come out, and it's going to come out in things like callousness. Just get over it. We lose our compassion. If we continue down that road, it leads to bitterness. And it can also lead to victim mentality. Everyone's out to get me. I'm always the one who gets the, the short end of the stick. Right? And that's a trap. That becomes a spiritual stronghold of the enemy over our lives. And now, now we're in a place where we need deliverance, not just healing, right? We need deliverance, okay? So, so there is a serious side to this. I don't want to, like, freak anybody out, but we do need to recognize that this is an area we need to be giving attention to, and we need to be allowing the Holy Spirit to have that, um, that area of our lives. Freud said this. He said, emotional suppression and repression impair physiological functioning. <laughs> you just ain't right. And, and people around you know it. Like, you, you, you can't hide it. So, and this is Freud. This is secular stuff, guys. But, but how many of you know biblical principles work in the secular world? Amen. Amen. Because Amen. God's that powerful. I mean, he, he created it all, right? So he knows how to fix it all. Freud's main theory was that human behavior is influenced by unconscious memories, thoughts, and urges. 
It's true. You can bury it as deep as you want, but it's there. It's there. Worry, fear, sadness, anxiety. We all face these every day, right? I'm not the only one. I'm pretty sure we're all human in here. If not, <laughs> it's how we choose to deal with them that determines the effect. Now catch this. The effect that they have not just on us, but on everybody around us. Everybody around us. Many times we describe these emotions as stress, right? But see, I think this is just another excuse, right? I'm just so stressed out right now. Like if I bite your head off, don't mind me, I'm just really stressed out right now. <laughs> or my favorite one, I'm hangry, although I feel that's real. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, so choosing to ignore them is not gonna make them magically disappear, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit about some facts about emotional health on our physical bodies. And this is something that I kinda of have some firsthand experience. I spent 15 years in EMS, responding to 911 calls and transporting people. Um, so I wanted to give you some medical facts. All right, so we already talked about how emotional unhealth will manifest itself in our physical bodies, often as stress. Um, high blood pressure, heart disease, by the way, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death globally, which is caused by high blood pressure and obesity and other things. Okay, see how this is all tying back together. Um, ulcers. Um, there are also some less obvious signs of emotional health in our bodies, such as difficulty sleeping, shoulder, neck, and back pain. You ever just be like, ah. Oh, stiff right now and you think it's because you're older maybe not headaches grinding your teeth that's a big one that's really becoming big right now people are having to get those guards for night for sleeping because they grind their teeth it's becoming a, big, a bigger problem um, feeling tired I have that every day um, weight changes stomach problems changes in eating habits like pastor Ed said pizza lack of compassion withdrawal from others we talked about that on Sunday we want to withdraw, we want to isolate, okay? All unhealthy signs. Now, these are just some of the long-term effects, but there are also more discrete ones, so if you pass that test, I got more for you. Here's six signs that show you're not in touch with your emotions. Number one, you keep yourself constantly busy. We think we can run from our problems. Anybody in here hate solitude and silence? Yeah. Number two, you intellectualize your emotions. That was me. I, 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 know, I'm a, I know I'm a chick, guys. I, I do know that, in case you were wondering. Um, but I, I, just my personality type, I tend to be more logical. And I, don't, I did not naturally connect with my emotions, believe it or not. Um, I have two daughters, and they are very emotional. Bless them. I love them. I don't always know what to do with them. But... <laughs> Uh, I, I, I had a hard time like connecting with the emotional side because to me, emotions aren't safe. Like they're illogical to me. And so I, I really had to let the Holy Spirit work on me to be able to um, embrace these different emotions, especially anger. Because I would always be like, I'm not mad. <laughs> My husband, though, I don't think he ever believed that. <laughs> He's a smart guy. All right, number three, you feel bad about feeling bad. You ever been like, why am I so sad? Like, ah, I don't know why I feel bad all the time. You ever walk around thinking you've hurt someone's feelings continually? Oh, oh she didn't say good morning. What did I say? <laughs> I sneezed at lunch and she didn't say God bless me. <laughs> he didn't make eye contact with me in the hallway. He's mad. I don't know what I did, right? And that constant worry. Amen? Four, you, your self-talk is harsh and judgmental. Do you think God talks to us that way? Do you think he's like, man, you're such a sinner. <laughs> you're so lucky you have my grace right now. <laughs> but we talk to ourselves that way, don't we? We do, we do. Number five, you're always asking for reassurance. Are you mad at me? Pastor Ed, is that okay what I said? I know. I probably am in trouble, but that's okay. We'll deal with that later. 
right? But you're, you're constantly, am I doing okay? How, 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 okay, I'm going to get you right now. How many of us, I'm not going to make you raise your hands because I know there's like a lot of us because I've been this person too. How many of us are like, oh, Lord, am I even saved? Like, do I have your Holy Spirit? I, like, I, I'm such scum. Like, am I even doing this right? Like, am I, I'm not even worthy, right? We do. We do. We self-condemn. And, and last but not least, you procrastinate a lot. Yeah. Me and Chris, man. Don't ask us for nothing because you ain't going to get it till the last minute. <laughs> right? So I think that we can pretty much at this point agree that most of us need to learn how to handle our emotions and stress in a healthy way. Right? If not, it's going to manifest in our physical bodies. And I ran on so many calls, you guys, where it would come out as like a chest pain. It would come out as shortness of breath. It would come out as hypertension. And when we would get on scene, we would recognize right away that the underlying cause was like anxiety. It was depression. It was conflict. We would, we would come up, and you could just tell when you walked in that there had been a blow up in that family. And then grandma hyperventilated, right? And now we're calling 911. But it was caused by conflict. It was caused by stress, anxiety, all these things. So it wasn't like they, they had you know, a blood clot that was causing the chest pain. It was that there was anxiety, there was stress, there was other factors that were causing them physical distress. And it's very real. Anybody in here has had a panic attack? It is very real, right? Your, your hands start to get all tingly. They lock up on you. You can't breathe, okay? That is real. Those physical symptoms that we experience because of our emotions are extremely real. And so I don't ever want to like gloss over that I acknowledge that, and, and there, there needs to be a solution for that, okay? We can't just try to go on living that way, because that's not living. Okay, so we already understand that this is something we need to become aware of, but why is all this important? Why is all this important? So we talked about emotional health, and the result is emotional immaturity, okay? But let's dive deeper. So what is emotional immaturity? What is it? And what factors play a role in it, okay? Because all of us, we didn't choose to like just grow up and be emotionally mature, right? I'm like, that's gonna be me. I'm gonna yell at everyone. No patience. No, we didn't pick that. We were a product partly of our environment, right? So emotional immaturity is the inability to properly identify and process emotions as they happen. It's that simple. We react to our emotions instead of re responding to them. We're not acknowledging them. It's not like um, someone cuts me off, right? I'm, I'm, I'm late and someone cuts me off and my first response is, wow, that made me angry. No, as Pastor Ed said, we give them the one-way sign to heaven, amen? <laughs> Brett. What is emotional immaturity? What factors play a role in it? Yeah, the inability to identify and process emotions as they happen. I'll, I'll repeat it again. So emotional immaturity is an inability to properly identify and process emotions as they happen. Okay, this is like the key for you guys. Key. All right, so some key characteristics of an emotionally immature person include selfishness. It's all about me, 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 me. And inadequate communication skills. Communication is huge, right? What does the Bible say? A soft answer turns away wrath. How hard is that? It's hard, right? It's like the fruit of the Spirit. Nothing works against the fruit. If we can learn to respond in the fruit, if we practice the fruit, but if we're not practicing fruit, if we're not recognizing first and foremost that I'm angry, right? Okay. Okay. These people will also um, have difficult difficulty in conversations or making jokes in serious emotional conflicts. They make it a joke, right? Try to lighten the mood, blow it off, because they can't deal with it. Okay. So there's a couple things that will affect us as we are growing up 
that play a role in how we're going to develop or lack of development in these areas. And number one is family of origin. Family of origin. How were emotions expressed and processed as you were growing up? When you were upset about something as a kid, were you told to be quiet and go back to your room? Were you told to get over it? Were you told to quit crying? Toughen up? Or I'll give you something to cry about? Or I'll give you something to cry about? <laughs> you think you have it bad? Yeah. Right? And then you got to hear about their childhood? Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, never mind? Yeah. Right? Um, some families have parents who okay. All right. So... I want to. I would love it if we could have somebody from the 30 and under group share, and then um, my 40 somethings, and then maybe 50 or older. So, one of those categories. Who wants to go first? If you don't volunteer, I'll pick you. It's okay. Robert. Yeah. So, how did culture shape your emotional health or unhealth? Now, Robert, is that something that's normal in your culture? Oh, my culture? Yes. Uh, growing up with some people in the home, uh, aunts and uncles, stuff like that. Yeah, I've never said, I've never said any of the stuff that other kids that they learn. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I identify as a 30 and under. Um, <laughs> Do you? <laughs> we'll, we'll, have, um, we'll have time for confession after. <laughs> we'll have time for confession. But this question, this question like got me because I never thought about this, right? So the culture in which I grew up in, uh, especially during the 80s, where I lived, I lived in the ghetto, high gang activity, mm -hmm. Uh, I was a minority. I was a little, little white boy Eddie growing up in, you know, gang infected area. And yeah. so my culture was always you, you got to show tough so that you don't get picked on. You got to be tough. You got, there is no softness. If you see softness, you're going to get taken advantage of. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, it's the first time I thought about that with regards to how does that affect me? Yeah. I don't think it actually affects me now, but it definitely affected me in the, in the past of how I treated people or how I related to people because mm -hmm. I was always like dude I'm not going to show you any weakness yeah because if I do you're going to take advantage of me that's good yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so I, I forgot that I grew up in a completely different church so culturally it was very very different okay um so it, it was an elementary you know we didn't really have emotions but um luckily in school I was able to have more emotions be more emotionally present and uh a lot of my friends were able to help me through that. So mm -hmm. I think luckily for like my generation, we're able to talk about it more um, as a more normal thing to talk about. So you said the church that you grew up in yeah. kind of taught not to show emotion? Yeah. So it was like, no, only for those. Okay, so it was more like a um like a religious culture that yeah. shaped you? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. That's interesting. Anyone else? Carol. Yeah, about the. I grew up till I was eight in New York. Okay, in New York. And I was very stressed. Mm Yeah, I can only imagine the culture from New York to California was very different. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Janice.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very difficult in that that white middle class era of almost like living with it with oppression and everything else. Yeah. And they were just like, oh my god. Yeah. You know, so it's like it's good. Anyone else? Oh my goodness. Um I don't know. I don't I don't want to pick favorites. Anna? <laughs> Yeah, so that again, that points back to our family of origin, what was acceptable and what was unacceptable, right? Yeah. Judy? I was just going to say, there's a movie called Pleasant Field. I don't know if anyone saw it, but that goes in the 50s. And everything inside that movie, I always relate to how I grew up because nobody talked, everybody acted like everything was okay. Mm -hmm. Even when there's chaos in the, yeah. in the house, they run around shutting the windows. But the, everything was white and black. And yeah. Was it. There was no gray area mm -hmm. in between. And I grew up thinking, oh my gosh, this is nuts. Yeah. You know, like I felt, I always felt like I was from another planet and <laughs> fell down into this cabbage patch, you know, where my parents lived in Azusa. And I mean, there was lots of mixed cultures and, you know, my own family's got mixed cultures. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, yeah. what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Rick. You know, uh, I always carry something in life with me too, but, uh, you know, my parents, Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you can talk about COVID, right? So for the younger generation, COVID. Um, I think about like all the school shootings and how kids have to go to school on lockdown constantly in fear of something terrible happening, right? Those are all cultural things that will affect us emotionally. Michelle, I think you raised your hand. saying was you didn't air your dirty laundry in public. Yeah. It just wasn't something, emotions and feelings weren't something that you, you addressed. They yeah. were something you dealt with yourself. They weren't something you communicated with. Yeah. And for us, we were like, if the sun was up, we were out running and we were gone. We didn't have to come home until the street lights came on. <laughs> so we were basically just amongst ourselves all day long, you know, and then when we came home, Unfortunately, our parents were alcoholics, so mm. the only thing we saw was this turmoil, and you know, so the next day we were out of there again. Yeah. yeah. You know? so, so you guys can see how, especially like Michelle's exam example is really great because I'm sure a lot of you can relate to being on your own a lot as a child and growing up, and you can see how it both climates affect you, right? So your home environment, and especially if there's drug addiction or alcoholism, that that shapes the environment at home. 
And then the cultural environment, when you go out with your friends, like, are they, you know, what are, your, what are the responses that they're having when it comes to emotions? Are they being made fun of or whatever the case may be? But it, you can see easily how both of these factors play into it. And culturally speaking, you know, we learn prescriptive norms that include rules about when to have emotions, what emotions are okay. Um, it's clear from the infant and child literature that we learn a lot about our emotions from our interactions with our caregivers. And so it's how, how, was, how were you responded to when you went to your parents or you went to your teachers with things that were bothering you? Um, you know, how was that dealt with and what were you taught? And so it's, it's really easy to see how we're shaped. And a lot of it, unfortunately, is in a negative way. Now, it should be safe to assume that a grown-up will be able to consider their impact on others and pay attention to their feelings. But sadly, this isn't the case. This isn't the case. But see, this is where we as the body of believers are different. And we have the Holy Spirit. And so this we don't have to settle. We don't have to settle. We can be healthy and we can be whole. Um, so how do, we, how do we recognize it? And then how are we going to start to... Um, you know, solve this issue, right? So your key for tonight is awareness. And, and I want you to remember this as you go throughout your week, is that start to just even become aware. Awareness, I always say this, it's 90% of your battle. Once you say, God, help me to be aware of my emotions. And I get it, this is risky. And I, I'm asking you to take that risk because I understand a lot of you have traumas and different pain and different things. But this is something that it's safe when we do it with God. He's been through everything. He's felt everything that we've felt. So he's the perfect person to walk with through this. And the Holy Spirit is amazing. He's a comforter. He's a teacher. He comes alongside of us. He reveals things to us. This, honestly, if we're willing to open up our emotions, this is such an intimate encounter we can have with God. And we can encounter the Holy Spirit in ways we've never encountered him before. So I'm going to ask you to just be brave and be willing to do this. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go inward with God. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to search and reveal hidden areas within us, okay? This is a brave prayer, right? David said it in Psalm 139. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. And this no word, again, we, we touched on this week one of the how to study your Bible, but this word no, it's like an intimate knowledge, okay? This is like God search every part of me, even the parts I don't want to see and I don't want you to see. Like have access to it. Put me to the test and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me. And this isn't just things that you might do to other people. This is how are you hurting yourself? And lead me in the way everlasting. So awareness of our emotions is our best weapon for battle. That's your blank. Awareness of our emotions is our best weapon for battle. We need to be willing to allow God to reveal our emotions just like we ask him to reveal our motives. Hopefully we're doing that, right? Then we're going to be able to partner with the Holy Spirit in navigating them. Have any of you ever experienced a time where you were in prayer or you were praying about something, maybe it was something that was bothering you, maybe it was something that you were struggling with, and God revealed something to you about that? Yeah? Yeah? How many of you have had God reveal something to you that you weren't even aware of? You ever doing something and, and God will bring a memory back to you and you're like, oh my gosh. Like, have you ever like snapped and then you're like, why did I snap on that person? Like, I don't even, I, don't, I, I like that person. Like, why would I even do that? And then the Holy Spirit will like connect the dot to you. Maybe like so, she reminded you of someone from your past that like you didn't like or did something mean to you. And you're like, oh. When we open up our heart and our emotions to God, He'll search it, and he'll begin to bring things to light that we need to go back and we need to revisit with him. And then our part in that is just to say, okay, yeah, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what that looks like. And honestly, nine times out of ten, I'm scared to death to do it. But if we just say yes, God does the rest. We just have to be willing. Okay, so as we close, let's talk real quick about emotions, God, and our relationship. So for I, I want to dispel any doubt that may be left amongst you guys that we really do have to deal with emotions, okay? And we're going to do that by looking at scripture and that God himself expresses emotion. And I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly. So if you're one of those people that loves to look up scripture later on, have your pen ready. Um, if you don't get it, see me after class and I'll give them to you. But we see that God expresses anger, Psalm 711. 
Deuteronomy 9.22 and Romans 1.18. Compassion, Psalm 135.14. Grief, Genesis 6.6 6, and Psalm 78.40. Psalm 7840 is grief, Genesis 6 6. Love, we know love is all over the Bible, right? First, first John 4 8 is probably the best. Hate, write down these two. Proverbs 6 16. Psalm 5 5. I'll give you a third one. Psalm 11 5. Look up the things that God hates. Um, jealousy. Exodus 25, Joshua 24, 19, and joy. My favorite, one of my favorite scriptures, Zephaniah 3, 17, and Isaiah 62, 5. What was that? Zephaniah 3, 17, and Isaiah 62, 5. And then one of the easiest ones to see um, Jesus himself expressing emotion, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. I, I love this example because it, it just proves to anybody who doubts, like, do we have to, like, go to God with our emotions? Yes, because, see, Jesus, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like, he knew that. But he had the whole thing, the whole, it was all, he knew what he was doing. And yet... He takes that moment, he sees their grief, and he weeps. He weeps. He expresses that emotion. He, he wasn't like, all right, get out of the way. I'm here, and you're all about to be happy in a moment. I got this. Lazarus, come forth, right? He could have, but he didn't. He did not bypass the process of going through the emotions in the moment. Okay, so to deny God's emotions is to deny that he possesses personality. To deny God's emotions is to deny that he possesses personality. There is a healthy way to express our emotions and not sin. We can be angry and not sin. We can hate the things God hates and not sin. Um, Jesus had passion and zeal, and we see that twice when he drove the money changers from the temple in Mark eleven fifteen through 18. And again, in John 2, 15 through 17, I'm going to read this one to you. Jesus is talking about Jesus. He made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Exclamation point. He's yelling at them. His, dis, uh, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your father's house will consume me. We see this poured out in the Psalms with David. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But have you ever read any of those Psalms where he's like, crush my enemies and scatter them, right? And you're like, dang, like, he ain't messing around, right? Um, so it, it is healthy to express these feelings. Um, when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see his emotions being poured out in beads of, of blood on his forehead. Those are some intense emotions, right? And that is actually medically true, okay? That is a medical condition that can happen. Um, I love that example from Scripture because in that moment, we see Jesus expressing his emotions to the Father in prayer and at the same time surrendering his emotions and his will down to the Father. It's like a perfect example of how we can, in a healthy way, go to God with our emotions and express them. So Jesus shows us that true surrender involves all three parts, mind, will, and emotions. We need all three. Your spiritual growth is dependent on it. Not only that, but it helps us relationally. It helps us relationally. We're going to be better Christians. We're going to be better friends when we're healthy. God created us with emotions to be able to connect with us on an emotional level. If you have put up walls, 
If you have decided, I am not going to feel these things anymore, guess what? When you do that, you don't get to pick and choose. You can't say, well, I'm going to put this wall up to protect myself, but I'm only going to do it to this person, this person, and this person. The truth is, when we put up walls around our heart, we put up walls to everybody. And the number one person we end up putting the wall up is God. So don't think that you can protect yourself by closing off your emotions because you're going to close off your emotions to the one who can actually heal you. And when we're willing to experience God on that deep emotional level, you're going to experience him in a way you've never experienced before. That is true intimacy. God created us because he wanted to, co to connect with us on an emotional level. So your relationship with God can only go to a certain level if you're closed off emotionally. You will not be able to encounter and experience God in all the ways he intends for you to if you are not willing to be emotional. Okay, so just to dispel every last question, why do I have to tell God how I feel? Doesn't he already know? That's a good question, right? Yeah. He knows everything, doesn't he? Because that's what he wants us to do. Number one, we need to express our emotions sometimes inward and sometimes outward. Like I'm an introvert, so I'm going to go inward first. It's how I'm built. It's how I'm created. I'm always going to go inward. I'm always going to try to process through it. I'm going to go into my prayer closet. I'm going to go through it with the Lord. But let me tell you, there are times where God does not give me the answer or the reconciliation I'm looking for in those inward moments because he fully intends for me to go outward. Because his plan for me is to connect with somebody. And so in that moment, I realize I'm not getting anywhere inwardly. So I need to call up a trusted friend, go have coffee and sit down and outwardly process it. And I can't tell you how many times God's used a special person in my life to just speak into me in that moment. And it's like, aha. Sometimes it's even in just me saying the things out loud. Like I just needed to speak it out. And then I'm like, oh, makes sense now. Right? So inward and outward processing, that is healthy. Not bottling them up, but expressing them. Number two, this is what God intended. Did you know the most common psalm in the book of Psalms is complaining or lament? Get this, 70%, 70% is either individual or communal complaining. It's either someone moaning and complaining or a group of people complaining. 70% of the Psalms. In fact, did you guys know there's a whole book of lamentations? There's a whole book of complaining. That's deep distress and despair, lament. That's like the pit of emotions, right? I love King David because he just bleh. Like he didn't, he didn't care. He didn't hold. I didn't care what's watching. He, he did. He just bleh, all the time, right? I, I'm gonna share just a couple with you real quick here as we close. But Psalm 39, 9, 38. I'm sorry, Psalm 38, nine and ten. Lord, all my desire is before you. He's like, here it is, right? And my sign is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. Was your first reaction to go to God and be like, God, I'm dying, <laughs> right? I just, I can't take it anymore, right? Like, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Psalm 6, 6 through 9. I am worn out from my groaning. All night, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Have you ever talked to God that way? Probably not, right? You know, you've been like crying and all of a sudden you're just like, why am I, God, do you see my pillow? <laughs> right? He says, my eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. So is, is David just pouring it out and then like whatever? 
Like, maybe God hears me, maybe he doesn't. No, he knows that the Holy Spirit is right there in that moment comforting him. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. You guys, it doesn't matter how much you want to complain. God's heard a lot of complaining before. You're not the first one. See, part of the problem is we think like God's too busy or God already knows, and and we just don't, right? But we need to not skip that step, and we need to go before the Lord, and we need to tell him, God, I am struggling right now. Like, I know I'm not supposed to be depressed, but I am depressed. And I, and I don't, I need to be okay to sit in that place with God. Because number one, there might be something he has for me there. See, because we don't, we don't glean and grow the most when things are great. We grow when we're struggling. And, and we want to be like, God, get us out of here. We don't want to struggle. And God's like, no, but there's something I have for you. There's a gift in that struggle if you're willing to sit there with me. And that's exactly what David is doing here. And so he's just an amazing example. And I encourage you guys, read through the Psalms. If you're struggling, look up Psalms for, you know, um, uh, lament and mourning and all those kinds of things. Grief is another whole topic that that is huge, but that's another whole area where you're going to get things in those seasons that you don't get in any other season. See, we need to stop looking at our negative emotions as bad things that we shouldn't be feeling. And we need to be willing to go through them, to embrace them, to accept them, to acknowledge them. God, I am feeling this way. It's okay to do that. You aren't going to stay stuck there. God is going to be faithful to walk you through that. Good stuff? Okay, so you have homework. Inside of your packet, you have a, um, a little quiz there that I want you each to take this week. So the two things, awareness and your little health, emotional health assessment. We're, we're not going to grade them in class, so don't worry. But we talked about awareness being the key. So be honest. Don't lie and don't be like, I always do this, right? I strongly agree. Okay? Be honest. No one's going to look at it. But this is something that when you're done, I want you to take and I want you to put this before the Holy Spirit and just reflect with him on it. And be like, God, what do you want to show me in this? All right, so next week we're going to look at the first step into emotional health, and that is going inward to find God. So that will be our topic for next week. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray it out so we can stop the video feed, and then I will take questions. So um, don't run away, okay? All right. Father, again, we just we want to thank you so much for this time. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you meet us wherever we're at, um, that there's nothing too hard, nothing too deep, um, that you won't go through with us that you haven't already experienced. And so I pray that you would just help us, God, help us to have that honesty with ourselves and with you, to be willing to be transparent and vulnerable before you, knowing that that is the doorway to healing, that that is the gateway to wholeness and real true peace and joy. And so I pray that you would um, just walk us through that, walk us down that pathway, show us what that looks like, Holy Spirit, when we don't know what to say or or how to even proceed, I pray that you would just continue to nudge us forward, illuminate the pathway, and just give us the next step, one step at a time, Lord, so that we stay in tune with you. And I ask, God, uh, that you would just to continue to bring healing, awareness, illumination. Father, I pray against the attacks of the enemy over every person here. Because he does not want us to discover this. He does not want us to be whole or to be healed. And so I just pray against his attacks right now, his discouragement in the name of Jesus. He has no place here, and he has no place on anyone in this room. And so we just declare your victory. um, and, And Father, I just pray that you would just go with us. Continue, continue, God, to just pour your love and draw us deeper and deeper into relationship with you so that we can experience the fullness of you and everything that you have to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.